As uh, promised, uh, we are delighted to be joined by Maria Francesca Spatolisano, the Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And she is flanked uh, by John Wilmoth uh, on her right, uh, the Director of the Population Division, Odessa, who you know well, and Patrick Gerland, the Chief of the Population Estimates and Projections Section, also in the Population Division of DESA. Welcome to the three of you, and uh, Ms. Patolisano, you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here for the launch of the World Population Prospects 2019. Today, the Population Division of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs in DESA is releasing a data set containing the latest edition of the Population Estimates and projections published by the United Nations since 1951. This is the publication. This data set presents population estimates as from 1950 <laughs> to the present for 235 countries and or areas comprising the total population of the world. The estimates are underpinned by a detailed evaluation of all available data sources, including nearly 1,700 national population censuses and 2,700 sample surveys. The data set also includes population projections to the year 2,100. These projections reflect a range of possible or plausible outcomes at the global, regional and national levels. The data set is accompanied by various reports and other materials describing global and regional trends in population, including the three components of population change, fertility, mortality, and international migration. It is often said that people are at the center of sustainable development. The population data being released today by the United Nations provide essential information about the world's people how many we are, how long we live, how many children we have, and so forth. These data show the progress we've made in some aspects of sustainable development, while also highlighting the need for further improvements. These data remind us of the demographic megatrends that shape today's world and affect our ability to achieve the sustainable development goals, the SDGs. They can be used by governments, international organizations, and other actors to anticipate future demographic trends and to incorporate that information into development policies and programs. These data are being used by the United Nations system to assess progress in implementing the 2030 Agenda. And in fact, more than a third of the indicators approved for use in the global monitoring of the SDGs depend on this data. Over the years, the world population prospects has been one of the most downloaded products of DESA, and we are proud to provide this essential information about the world's population. Mr. John Wilmot, Director of the Population Division, will now introduce some of the main results contained in the World Population Prospects 2019. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. The results of World Population Prospects 2019 confirm that the world's population has grown rapidly in the lifetime of the United Nations. From an estimated two and a half billion people in 1950, the global population has grown more than threefold and now numbers around 7.7 .7 billion. Using demographic and statistical methods, we have projected the global population forward to 2100. Our latest projections indicate that growth will continue and that the global population could number around 9.7 billion in 2050 and 10.9 billion in 2100. Just as significant as the increase in numbers is the fact that the global population is aging. Across the globe, the distribution of the population by age is shifting upward from younger to older ages. Understanding and anticipating these changes, both the growth and the aging of the human population, are extremely important as the world seeks to set a path towards sustainable development. With this revision of the world population prospects, we are drawing attention 
to the inherent uncertainty that surrounds all projections of future population trends. For example, these latest projections indicate that the size of the world's population is likely to lie between 9.4 and 10.1 billion in 2050 and between 9.4 and 12.7 billion in 2100. We can have a relatively high degree of certainty about the projections for 2050 because more than half of the people who will be alive in 2050 have already been born. For 2100, however, the range of plausible outcomes is much wider. Nevertheless, one feature that all of the current scenarios have in common is a continuing slowdown in the pace of population growth from now until 2100. According to the projections being released today, it seems plausible that the world's population could reach its peak around 2100 at a level of nearly 11 billion people. However, that outcome is not certain, and in the end, the peak could come earlier or later at a lower or higher level of total population. Notwithstanding the interest of these long-term projections, we should focus our attention on the implications of population trends between now and 2030 or 2050, when policy interventions made today can contribute directly to sustainable development. In closing, I wish to recognize that this new data set is the result of many months of work by my colleagues in the Population Division. I would like to acknowledge the dedicated and hardworking staff members who have contributed to the work being released today. And at this point, we would be happy to answer any questions that you may have, assisted also by Mr. Patrick Gerlon, uh, who led the technical work on World Population Prospects 2019. Thank you. How did you uh, welcome on behalf of the UN, <coughs> excuse me, UN Correspondent Association? I'm Evelyn Leopold. Can you, um, is it true that Africa still has, uh, the population is rising because of the birth, uh, the number of children per family? And uh, what has happened? What is the relationship, access to family planning in? for those who want it, particularly in countries that have difficulty supporting children? Well, um, certainly the growth in Africa continues because the number of births exceeds the number of deaths that occur every year. So um, what, what set off this uh, episode of growth was actually the reduction of mortality. It, it was the increased survival among children and mothers and and really across the age range, that's what caused the growth. But then the continuing high levels of fertility then perpetuate that growth. And uh, there has been some progress in reducing the level of, of the birth rate um, as uh, access to family planning has increased. Uh, but it continues to be the case that uh, a, a significant number of women in, in Africa who have an expressed need for family planning do not have access. I believe it's around one quarter. Of, uh, of those who express a need for family planning uh, who do not actually have access to, uh, to contraception. So there, there, is this, there is this continuing policy gap uh, and in access to uh, the means of contraception that would lead to further reductions of the growth rate. Yes. Thank you uh, for the uh, briefing and the reports. Uh, of the 22 countries that uh, that was expected to contribute 1.5 billion into population growth. What is the main factor? What is the common uh, um, um, factor among them that makes these countries have this boom in population? And uh, also what's uh, interesting for me, I see three Middle Eastern countries, despite their economic challenges, they are one of the top expected contributors of population growth. Can you also uh, talk about why it's happening in those countries, uh, Iraq, Egypt, especially? <laughs> Thank you. There is, as you can see, both eager to reply, may I ask, <laughs> Mr. Patrick, uh, to do so. It's on? 
Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, the, <clears throat> the answer is somewhat related to what uh, Mr. Wilmus was uh, explaining earlier. Uh, to a large extent, many of these countries are least developed countries that are facing many development challenges, including in this context, uh, access to health, uh, education, and various economic opportunities. And uh, a lot of the goals of the 2030 development agenda are aimed to address many of those challenges. And uh, uh, the continuing population growth that those countries experience are associated to many of those uh, challenges. We seem to have the uh, economic challenges, but uh, there is relatively uh, a better family planning um, and health uh, when it's come to the health sector to, in terms of to other countries. Uh, what, what is the particular factors in those countries? Uh, those countries are part of the group of countries that have experienced already many of these changes, as you are aware, in previous decades. But you have today large courts of young adults, of young people, and those uh, uh, those large courts of young people have themselves families. So you have this momentum, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, inertia in the, uh, in the large population of many of these countries that even if the, the number of children, the size of these families are smaller than the ones of their parents, you have by itself this continuation of a growth in their populations. Thank you. Um, forgive me, I haven't had a chance to read the report yet, but I wonder if you could speculate as to why the growth rate is slowing to the degree that it is. Or have you identified any factors there? The, uh, the growth rate slows down as, as populations uh, gradually lower the fertility level. Usually this follows a, a, a reduction of the mortality level, which in, in, in instigates the growth to begin with. Um, and then gradually over time, populations move toward lower levels of fertility. Why they do that, there's a multiplicity of reasons for this. Uh, increasing levels of education, uh, especially of women. Increasing levels of labor force participation among women. Increasing... Uh, urbanization of the population, uh, the change in the, in the labor market uh, to where uh, work is more concentrated through the market uh, rather than through uh, agricultural, uh, in agricultural settings. And, and th this, these multiple factors come together to uh, motivate people to have smaller families and to make large families very costly. And uh, ultimately, though, they need to have the access to the means of reducing their family size, uh, and, and that comes through access to modern methods of contraception. So it's really a multi, I don't know if this answers your question, where, what you were driving at, but it's a multiple factors that lead to the decrease, ultimately. Thank you so much. I have actually two questions. One of them, I'm sure you will, you will consider it a silly question, but I have to ask. This is our job. Um, first of all, why there is no press release in Arabic? Arabic is official language. Um, uh, we know English and we, ha we know how to translate, but it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a way to respect journalists who speak Arabic. If you have a press release in Arabic because it's unfair uh, that we're going to report and then we start uh, translation. When you translate, sometimes you lose uh, what you want to say. I, I suggest next year, I hope you have one press release in Arabic. The second thing, every word in, in this book you produce is very important. That's why you produce it. But can you tell me what value can be added to your work when you publish a photo on page 22? This photo, wh why, what's the purpose of having this photo? And just maybe, maybe something missing. Thank you. First of all, my, my apologies for there not being a, a, a press release in Arabic. Um, uh, this, is, th this has been a challenge for us uh, to, to have the press release in more languages than just English, and I think we increased the number of languages in which the press release is available compared to what happened last time. But you're absolutely correct that Arabic should also be included among them, and I, I cannot tell you the exact reasons that that did not happen in this case. 
The photograph on page 22, well, uh, what does it show? You know, uh, <laughs> Sometimes I think the reports coming from the Secretariat are, are characterized as being a little bit boring compared to what comes from UNICEF, UNFPA, WHO. And so, you know, maybe we're trying to play that game a little bit of, you know, giving something a little bit more lively, uh, a little bit more engaging to catch the human interest. But um, I take your point. Perhaps, it, you know, perhaps it's adding nothing substantively, but I think often we're criticized for going in the opposite direction and being too dry, just the facts, ma'am. And now we're trying to be a little bit more uh, friendly with the presentation. Stefano? Yes, hello. Stefano Vaccare, La Voce in New York, Radio Radicale in Rome. Um, about the point of uh, migration, um, I see that you, I mean, you, you're talking about between 2010, 2020, so. I mean, we are in 2019, we're talking practically about the past. So my question instead is about the future. And he's, uh, it looks like from what you write here, at least what I read, that he's, uh, that you, um, you mentioned some country like Belarus, Estonia, Germany, and Hungary, Italy, Japan, Russian Federation, Serbia, and Ukraine will experience a net inflow of migrants over the decade, helping to offset population losses caused by an excess of death, of deaths over births. So you kind of give a, a positive, uh, um, you know, explanation of this uh, migration. And you, with this, it looks like, thank God to these migrants, because your population was decreasing, at least like this, you, you would be able to pay your pensions. But my question is about, to, after 2020, because we know that there are many countries, those countries that you actually mentioned, many, they change governments, and they actually doing now a policy that is against migration. They didn't even sign the global compact on migration. So I know your position there is not to be political. You're not, you're just statistical if you want. You give me statistics. But can you tell me the statistic in the next 10 years, what's going to happen? Are those countries, do you predict that those countries anyway, doesn't matter what is the campaign, political campaign, they're going to receive a certain numbers of migrants? Well, I, I will take this one too. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, I think your first question was how can we be saying something about the decade of 2010 to 2020 given that we're still, we haven't finished the decade. We're still in 2019. And for this, I, I guess I, I, I can share with you some of the tricks of the trade. Uh, uh, the truth is we don't know everything that has happened even through 2018. The data are still coming in. So even when we talk about 2019, we're doing a certain amount of extrapolation forward from the data that are actually available to us, which may end in 2014 or 2015. And we have to, even to get to the present time, we're doing a little bit of extrapolation forward with the data. And so it's really just a small step beyond 2019 to 2020 and to make statements about the, uh, about the decade. And, but this, this technique works fairly well because population trends evolve fairly slowly. And so we, we get it fairly pretty close with this, with this method. So I wouldn't worry too much about the fact that we're close. To, we haven't finished the decade, but we're saying what's going to happen on the whole over the course of the decade. We know fairly well what will happen over the course of the decade. What will happen in the next decade and beyond, of course, is anyone's guess. And of course, there are policy changes, especially in the area of migration. This is the most difficult of the three population components to project, birth, death, migration. By far, migration is the least predictable because it's subject to these sorts of policy changes that you cited. We tend to, uh, you know, we, we choose assumptions on migration based on what has happened in the recent past. We cannot anticipate all of the changes that may or may not happen because of policy changes that take place. Change, we cannot anticipate the changes and trends that may take place because of the policy changes that are happening currently or that will take place in the future. What we do is we assume that on average for a country, it will be similar to what has happened in the recent decades. And uh, overall, this is a reliable assumption to use, but obviously for some individual countries, it will not produce perfect results. But we know anytime we say anything about the future, there will be uncertainty, and, and we have to do the best that we can. And this is a method that has proven to work fairly well in the past, so we continue to employ it. <laughs> 